The 22nd of February is quite an ordinary day. If you asked any passerby the anniversary of which event came on the 22nd of February 2021, you would hardly get an answer. Because this is one of those anniversaries that are not considered to be remembered in modern Russia. Whereas in 2017 the centenary of the October Revolution could not be totally ignored by TV, today, I'm afraid, they will tell about anything, but not about the fact that a hundred years ago perhaps the most important event in the entire Soviet economic history took place. The resolution of the Council of People's Commissars approved the regulation on the State General Planning Commission. The 22nd of February 2021 marked the 100th anniversary of Gosplan, the main economic department of the Soviet Union, the core of the planned economy. It is impossible to tell the whole history of Gosplan in a short video. So I would like to focus today on the circumstances of its origin. December 1919, the height of war communism, the civil war was raging. Donbass with its coal was not regained yet, and the railways for transporting coal to central Russia were destroyed. Under these conditions, Lenin turned to his old friend Gleb Maximilianovich Korzyzhanovsky with a request to write an article on peat as a local raw material for power plants. In the famous photo of the founders of the League of Struggle for the Emancipation of the Working Class, from which both the Bolsheviks and the Mensheviks would later grow, Martov, the future leader of the Mensheviks, is sitting to the right of Lenin, and Gleb Maximilianovich Krzyzhanovsky is sitting to the left. Krzyzhanovsky, together with Lenin, led revolutionary activities. Together with him, he was arrested and exiled. They served exile in neighboring villages, and when Lenin, while still in Siberia, began the struggle against economism with the protest of the Russian Social Democrats, Gleb Maximilianovich was among the signatories of this protest. It was Krzyzhanovsky and his wife who Lenin instructed to organize the central bureau of the Russian Iskra in Samara. After the defeat of the 1905 revolution, another prominent Bolshevik, Leonid Borisovich Krasin, arranged for Krzyzhanovsky to work for the Electric Lighting Society of 1886. In later years, Krzyzhanovsky made a career in the energy sector, becoming the head of the construction of the first Russian regional power plant. Both Krasin and Krzyzhanovsky gave jobs to many revolutionaries, which made the meetings of construction leaders not much different from the party meetings. By the revolution, Krzyzhanovsky was respected both among the specialists, the old technical intelligentsia, and among the revolutionaries. It was just the person that Lenin needed. In January 1920, Lenin demanded that Krzyzhanovsky expanded his note on the use of peat, strengthening the socio-political sound of the text, so that the plan would be not technical, but political, or state, that is, a task for the proletariat. I think the plan like that, I repeat, not a technical one, but a state, a draft plan, you could give. It must be given now, in plain language, in order to captivate the masses with a clear and vivid, quite scientific at the core, perspective. Say, get to work, and in 10-20 years we will make all Russia, both industrial and agricultural, electric. Let's work up to so many, thousands or millions of horsepower or whatever the devil only knows, machine slaves and so on. Can we also have an approximate map of Russia with centers and circles? Oh, this is not possible yet. I repeat, we must captivate the masses of workers and class-conscious peasants with a great program for 10-20 years. In conditions of war, hunger, cold, devastation, Lenin demanded that Krzyzhanovsky project a positive, concrete and technically achievable image of the future. On the 2nd of February, Lenin introduced Krzyzhanovsky's brochure to the session of the All-Russian Central Executive Committee, the highest authority in the Soviet country. The All-Russian Central Executive Committee instructed the Supreme Council of the National Economy to develop a project for the construction of seven power plants, and for this purpose the Council created, under the leadership of Krzyzhanovsky, the State Commission for the Electrification of Russia, in abbreviated form GOEL-RO, 
Krzyzynowski attracted several dozen engineers, technicians and economists to work in the Commission, and they developed an electrification plan in 10 months. The transfer of industry from steam to electricity promised a jump in labor productivity, an increase in production, and ultimately an approach to that abundance, accessible to everyone, which was the material prerequisite of communism. Let's leave the Goel Rock Commission to work for now and turn to another line in our today's story. In April 1920, the Ninth Party Congress was held, at which one of the most urgent issues was the revival of the economy. The delegates agreed that the main condition for the economic revival of the country is the steady implementation of a unified economic plan oriented for the nearest historical epoch. The problem was that this unified economic plan did not exist. The Bolsheviks, having come to control the economy of the war-torn country, mastered this economy from the bottom up. First, plans for the work of nationalized factories appeared, then of nationalized branches. Each department of the Supreme Council of the National Economy was responsible for its own industry and made plans for it. The plans were supposed to be coordinated by the Central Production Commission of the Supreme Economic Council. But in addition to the Council, there were also the People's Commissariats for Agriculture, for Food, for Finance, etc. Yuri Larin calculated that by November 1920 there were 59 departments that established the plan on a national scale. In addition, the plans of the departments critically depended on the supply of resources, primarily raw materials, fuel and food, which were disposed of by the Utilization Commission and the Main Fuel Committee. This gave rise to numerous commissions, in which the interests of different administrations and different people's commissariats were coordinated with swearing and mutual accusations. In January 1920, at a meeting of the Communist faction of the Central Council of Trade Unions, Lenin complained that the departmental fight in the Council of People's Commissariats was going on so constantly that he wanted to drown himself. And this is only in the center. In the provinces, local councils also did not want to surrender their power without a fight, when in accordance with the general tendency of war communism towards centralization, branches of the central administrations appeared in local communities, there were detached proceedings on who should manage the economy on the territory. The Ninth Party Congress formed the following priorities for the unified economic plan. First of all, improving the state of transport, the supply and formation of the most necessary stocks of grain, fuel and raw materials. Mechanical engineering for transport and for the extraction of fuel, raw materials and grain. Enhanced development of mechanical engineering for the production of consumer goods. Increased production of consumer goods. The technical basis of all these measures was to be electrification. But the Congress did not say anything about how and by whom the work on the creation and implementation of this unified plan should be built. Instead, it adopted a resolution on the organizational connection between the economic commissariats, shifting the task of working out a scheme that would ensure complete unity in carrying out the economic plan to the Central Committee of the Party. The Congress instructs the Central Committee to develop in the near future a system of organizational communication between the Supreme Economic Council and other commissariats directly related to the economy, people's commissariats for food, for agriculture, for land, in their daily work, in order to ensure complete complete unity in the implementation of the economic plan approved by the Party Congress. This gave rise to a discussion about a single economic plan, which went on throughout 1920. Almost all the leaders of the party and the economic bodies – Gusev, Gurevich, Baskov, Varga, Kaktin, Kritzman, Krumin, Melutin, Nogin, Trotsky, Shapiro, and of course Larin – pitched their ideas on how to assemble something whole from a heap of departmental projects and programs. The common line of most of the proposals was the desire to come up with a mechanism for coordination and mutual subordination of different departments, which would make it possible to link their private plans easier and simpler than it had been before. The situation resembled Krylov's fable The Quartet. The authors hoped that if the musicians swapped places, they would begin to play better. However, little attention was paid to the very nature of the plans, to the principles of their drawing up. By most accounts, the root of the evil was in the fact that the arbitrators, the bodies called upon to settle disagreements, 
in terms of apparatus weight, were at best equal to those authorities whom they were supposed to make friends with each other. Most authors, therefore, tended to believe that the main arbiter in the disputes of the people's commissariats should be the Council of Labor and Defense as the most authoritative institution. In such an atmosphere, the December 1920 came, with the 8th All-Russian Congress of Soviets, gathered in Moscow in the dark and cold Bolshoi theater. All delegates were given a volume of the Govelro plan. The report on it was made jointly by Lenin and Krzyzanowski. The plan set out not just the construction of power plants, but the rational distribution of industry in seven economic regions, taking into account their energy and raw materials resources. In addition, a set of measures was planned to increase the production of coal, oil, peat. To transport fuel and raw materials, it was necessary to reconstruct the transport. The Goalero plan already provided for the conversion of railways to electric traction and the construction of lines specialized for freight traffic, the so-called superhighways. Construction of power plants, reconstruction of fuel extraction and transport required metal. Therefore, inevitably, the development of metallurgy and mechanical engineering was projected in the Goalero plan. Iron smelting had to grow more than twice, and the aluminium industry had to actually be created anew. Of course, these plans also required the development of the production of building materials. Thus, the Goelro plan contained tasks for a number of industries and, what's the most important, was internally coordinated. A huge map of Russia with light bulbs on the sites of existing and future power plants was installed on the stage. In the course of Krzyzhanovsky's report, they lit up one by one, until the entire map began to shine with electric light. The bright future lit up the faces of the delegates of the Congress in the most literal way. Adding to the effect, Lenin announced that communism is Soviet power plus electrification of the whole country, and declared the Goelro plan to be the second program of the party. The party program says what we want, and the Goelro plan how we will achieve it. According to Lenin, this was the single economic plan, and there was no need for any other plan except the Goelro plan, but it needs to be expanded and supplemented. The Goelro plan contained tasks for a number, but still not all branches of the economy. The question remained how to ensure its implementation organizationally. In the end, the most logical decision prevailed. Everyone knows the comic principles of initiative is punishable, and if you want to do well, do it yourself. The Goyle Rock Commission was transformed into the State Planning Commission, which was given power to set tasks for the economic commissariats. But this decision, which is obvious now, was not at all obvious at that time. From the Lenin's notes published in the complete set of his works, it follows that all the existing economic bodies opposed the creation of the State Planning Committee. They did not need a competitor. During the preliminary discussion of the issue on the 18th of February, the decision was opposed by Yuri Larin, representing the interests of the Commission for the Use of the Supreme Council of National Economy, Alexei Ivanovich Rykov, who headed the Supreme Council of National Economy, Vladimir Pavlovich Milutin, the former deputy chairman of the Presidium of the Supreme Economic Council, Valerian Valerianovich Osinsky, a member of the Board of the People's Commissariat for Food. Lenin responded with an article on a single economic plan. In it, he wrote that the arguments of his comrades are empty talk, ambitious style and bureaucracy. The most boring scholasticism, up to the chatter about the law of chain link and stuff like that, scholasticism either literary or bureaucratic, but there is no living thing. What is worse, arrogant bureaucratic disregard for the practical work that has already been done and which must be continued. Again and again, the empty production of theses, or sucking slogans and projects out of the finger, instead of careful and thorough acquaintance with our own practical experience. The only serious work on the issue of a single economic plan is the electrification plan of the RSFSR. From Lenin's article, we learn about the main objections of critics. Unfortunately, the original texts of their speeches are not so easy to find now. Let's restore at least part of the old before building a new one. Electrification is similar to electrofiction. Why not gasification? Goelro has bourgeois specialists, few communists. 
Goelro should provide expert personnel and not staff for General Planning Commission, etc. Osinski proposed not to implement the Goelro plan until economists checked it. Rikov suggested waiting till the Electrotechnical Congress. Larin wanted to put an economic presidium over the Goelro Commission, which would agree or not agree on its proposals. Summarizing these objections, Lenin wrote in the margins, the man chops, the horse pulls, the Soviet employee steals, the economist writes theses. Lenin personally revised the first paragraph of the draft regulation, turning the Goel Ro Commission into a general planning commission. According to the initial version, it was supposed to deal only with electrification. According to the final, with the whole complex of issues for creating a national plan based on electrification. In this form, the regulation on the State Planning Committee, which defined its rights and obligations, was approved by the Council of People's Commissars on the 22nd of February 1921. The State Planning Commission was given the authority to review production programs and proposals of all departments for their compliance with the national plan. For this, all departments were required to give the State Planning Commission all the necessary materials and explanations. Also, the chairman of the State Planning Commission received the right to report directly to the Labor and Defense Council. Due to the creation of the State Planning Commission, the Goelro plan did not remain ink on paper, since in fact the entire structure of economic management was rebuilt in such a way as to give its developers the leverage to implement the plan. The planning bodies of the People's Commissariats were built on the principle of double subordination to the People's Commissar or his deputy and the State Planning Committee. In addition, the the State Planning Commission coordinated the programs of the Economic People's Commissariats, as the ministries were called then, for their compliance with the national plan. Another feature of the plan was its ideological, socio-political charge. From the very beginning, the goal was set so that the plan would become their own for all the workers in the country of the Soviets, so that each worker understood why it is worth participating in its implementation and what exactly should be done. The masses should not only know, but also feel that the reduction of the period of hunger, cold and poverty depends entirely on the prompt realization of our economic plans by them. The most important feature of all plans developed by the State Planning Commission, a feature formed precisely in the Goelro plan, was the reliance on the introduction of advanced technical achievements. The unified plan had to be based not on administrative plans of various departments cobbled together, but on tasks of transferring the country's economy to a higher technical level. The State Planning Commission analyzed advanced Soviet and foreign technologies, determined what economic effect they gave, in what volumes they could actually be implemented in the coming years, and what was lacking for this. Orientation towards advanced technology, towards progress – that was the feature of planning, which Lenin literally pushed through with his authority, overcoming the resistance of his less far-sighted colleagues. He understood clearly that inertia, departmental interests, economic disorder, conservatism could not be defeated at once. In the December 1920, at the Eighth Congress of Soviets, Lenin said that the struggle for the success of economic construction, for the success of electrification, would be far more difficult than the struggle on the fronts of the civil war. The biographies of the leaders of the State Planning Commission confirmed that fully. Lenin rushed the newly established State Planning Committee into creating a food supply plan for the country for the 1921-22, built on the basis of the feed grain balance. This urgent measure was absolutely necessary in the political and economic conditions of the transition to the new economic policy, when it was needed to have a scientific basis for developing new relationships with the peasantry. This first plan demanded such efforts from the State Planning Commission and its chairman, that when the food plan was ready at the end of the summer, Lenin concluded that Kzhizhanovsky had almost strained himself, and through the organizing bureau of the Central Committee of the party made him go on a leave of absence for a month. The creation of a planned economy taxed powers to the utmost. In the first years, the power center in the planning and management of industry remained at the Supreme Council of the National Economy. Felix Edmundovich Dzerzhinsky became the chairman of the Supreme Economic Council in the January 1924, worked in this position for two and a half years, and died. Before his death, Iron Felix, 
wrote to Kuybyshev that he felt absolutely done in. Krzyzhanowski moved from the State Planning Commission to the Academy of Sciences in 1930, which allowed him to live to be 77 years old. And his successor Kuybyshev served as a chairman of the State Planning Commission for five years and died before he was 48. After Kuybyshev, Mezhilau was the chairman. The party considered that he was not working well enough. He was shot. After Mezhlauk, Voznesensky was the chairman of the State Planning Commission, he was also shot. When Khrushchev came to power, they stopped shooting the chairman. But since the State Planning Committee was not enthusiastic about Khrushchev's innovations, he mercilessly removed them from their posts. Between 1948 and 1965, ten leaders were replaced in the State Planning Commission. The State Planning Commission itself was divided twice and again united. Stability came only in 1965, when Nikolai Konstantinovich Baybakov became chairman. Historian Vyacheslav Nikrasov believes that Baybakov was appointed deliberately as a politically weak figure. In the late Soviet years, Gosplan worked calmly and steadily, did not get into trouble. Its chairman did not argue with anyone and happily lived until 2008. However, the price of this calmness was a steady decline in the pace of development of the country. Therefore, marking the anniversary of the State Planning Commission today, let us remember the planners who literally did not spare their lives and health, creating the foundation of the current economic development of our country. By the way, the Moscow apartment of Gleb Maximilianovich Krzyzhanovsky works as a branch of the Museum of Modern History of Russia. The anniversary year is a great reason to go on an excursion. Thank you.